Um, hello, I'm Meryl Gilbert. I am the new community leader for WEIC's new group called Inside Ops. It is formerly known as Supply Chain, but we have now combined operations compliance and supply chain into one daily working group. I am also the co-founder and CEO of Trace Trust. We are a nationwide compliance and product manufacturing agency, and I'm very excited to launch this new community and our new podcast that we are going to discuss today, um, our first topic and our first guest who is um, with us and it's Haley Glover. I'm going to let her tell you about herself, but um, she is from Sa Sapphire Risk Advisory Group. And we are going to talk about one of the most important subjects that is affecting our industry today, and that is security. And that is going to cover everything from what is a risk assessment to what um, we need to do about theft and burglaries and security and cyber. So we are going to jump into this, but I want to introduce um, Haley, who is joining me today to talk about this amazing topic. I want her to tell us a little bit about ourselves, and then we're going to jump into our subject today. Thank you, Meryl. My name is Haley Glover. I'm the Senior Security Consultant at Sapphire Risk Advisory Group. We're a nationwide cannabis security consulting firm. We've been in business since 2013. Um, we have done work in 35 states and done about 70, 70 build-outs so far for the security. Uh, we specialize in writing the security section of city and state applications, uh, standard operating procedures, and then, of course, the build-out side of things. That's kind of where my specialty is, is I help with the phase two. Uh, our main goal is obviously to keep our clients compliant, but also be proactive about their security practices to really prevent or at least reduce the chances of having any events occur. So I'm excited to be on here and get started. So this is not our first conversation. We um, have spent a couple of times together now really getting ready for this, this important um, discussion. And one of the things that you and I felt should be the first part of this is to really talk about what risk is and what a risk assessment is and why this is so relevant to any business, to any ancillary business, to any product. Um, and we really wanted to take that approach first. So I'm going to let you jump in onto that subject because when we talk about risk assessment, that really encompasses everything. So I'm going to let you chat about that. Absolutely. Uh, cannabis is obviously a high risk business. So a risk assessment is where we would go in and review current or potential security and safety risk exposures. Uh, what we really want to identify is if there are any gaps in your standard operating procedures, if you might be lacking some equipment, like not having enough cameras on your exterior of your building or the really high risk areas like a trim room or your secure storage. So we go in and we identify what those risks might be so that we can fix it and really reduce any possible threats in the future. Interestingly, when I think about risk, I think about everything, right? So from the front door to the back door, not just um, in it, and in particular, you know, since we're here to talk about cannabis and stuff, but we talk about, you know, the cultivation side, which has got, you know, a lot of agricultural aspects to that. We have lighting and building and inside, outside, all of these, these issues that go to that. Then we get to processing. Right, so after it's taken out of the ground or um, it's, it's pot, um, it's then the next level of that. So what, when you, you talk about this assessment, what does that look like when we look at the you know, opening to closing, when we look at front to back, when we look to interior, what are some of those, um, because we're gonna get into to the more details, but what does that look like when we, can you go a little deeper into the, to what we're looking at here, not just around cameras? Absolutely. So whenever we arrive to a location, we look at the exterior first. Um, we don't even go to that front door for a good 30, 45 minutes. So we want to look at their lighting on the exterior of the building. Is it a well-lit facility? Do they have shrubbery that's very close to the building to where it might be able to be a hiding spot for a potential theft? Um, we'll look at the fencing. For a cultivation facility, we really want to make sure that that perimeter is enclosed and you can't see from the exterior what's going on in there. 
Um, if they can see that, it's, it's more of a threat of they know what they're working with, they can see the hours that you're there and really understand your operation from the exterior. Um, even looking at the entry and exit points, do they look secure? Is it something where the door looks like it would be easy to break into? Um, obviously glass doors might be a little bit more high risk. And so, you know, we try to recommend having a high security door, having security guards or utilizing camera analytics to really detect if somebody is intruding when they shouldn't be there. Um, but we really start from the outside in and Obviously, from cultivation to retail, it's a little bit different, but for the cultivation, we really try to focus on the visitor access, uh, really see how they're able to gain access into that building, who's checking IDs to make sure that they are an employee there. Obviously, there can be some high turnover, and so we want to make sure that the right people are on site when they're supposed to be. So does this carry over into the vetting of who your suppliers are and your your partners and your vent, you know, all of, all of these things, does this, you know, not just the physical piece of this, does this look at, and then, you know, we talked a little bit about hiring and staffing, right? So where does all of this play in to, you know, what we like to talk about these SOPs and these standard operating procedures, but we all know that they're not always there. So how does all of this play into not just the risk assessment, but, you know, planning your, how you, you run your business? Absolutely. So we try to implement best practices across the board, whether the state requires it or not. Um, you want to make sure that you're keeping logs. It, you know, it's not a horrible idea to capture driver's license or, you know, a employee badge that really shows where they came from, what they're there for, and the allotted time they're allowed to be there. Keeping those logs is perfect for whenever the state does come and perform an audit. Or if an event occurs, you can go back and look and see when somebody was there and be able to review that as needed. So really keeping track of everything and I would say making sure that the if, it, if it's a vendor that does come and do a shipment or they're picking something up that it is the right person and if there's any question about that then that's when you would have to put things on pause and really go back and review that. There should never be question of who's at your facility especially at cultivation. The entire facility is considered limited access or restricted access, and it really should only be employees or known vendors. There should never be a question of who is this person who's showing up at my facility. So when we um, look at that, and then we start to look at you know who's allowed, who's not allowed, and employees, how does that now translate into the hiring process and the technology process? Absolutely. There are some states that will require a background check on every single employee or anyone who's involved in the industry, whereas other states may not be as strict on it, but still going through a vetting process, uh, maybe working with reputable vendors that can help guide you to the right partners. Because again, this is a lot of money, time, effort that goes into this, and it is your business that could potentially lose a lot of money if you don't do it correctly. So doing the research, um, again, trusted vendors are extremely important so that you can prevent any of that kind of thing from happening. But so when we get to the security, and, and so obviously the next piece, you know, is technology, right? So the whole cyber, we hear so many different things. What are the key points just at the high level and then more into the nitty gritty that we all need to know about when we look at our different operating systems, our different um, technologies, and where are some of the most um, visible vulnerabilities, I guess, that people need to be aware of? Uh, for the cybersecurity? And yeah, and, and your overall technology, right? Cyber, you know, is, is the threats against it, but then just actual usage, right? Who's, who has access, who doesn't? What are, what are the components of things that you're looking for yeah. when you're setting these systems up, maintaining the systems, adding new systems, adding new people, not have, you know. Absolutely. And then, There's, and then the outside threat of the cyber. Right, there's tons of components that are involved with the security, whether that be the cyber or physical security. Um, just from the physical security side, you'll have your alarm systems, your access control systems, your surveillance systems. And all of these need to be commercial grade. They need to be made for a cannabis facility. There's a lot of components there, lots of devices, and especially in some states, there are just 
tons of redundancy between the systems. Now, obviously, all of those security systems will go onto your network. And after speaking to a few of my IT specialists at Curate, they had mentioned that keeping things on separate networks, that's how you can keep it safe. That's how you can really individualize from your point of sale system, or you can individualize it from a uh, employee network so that they can go on their break and they can be on their phone and they're able to safely do that. And the same thing for guests at your facility, but really keeping those items separate. And then that way, when there is a vulnerability or if there's a, a malicious attack, it's something where it can target just that one network and it's not affecting your workstations or your point of sale or your security systems. Um, they're, they're getting a little bit smarter at the hacking. So it's super important to really keep those separate so it's not attacking every part of your business to where you have, would have to potentially close for a few weeks until you could identify where that risk was. So if I was not very technical savvy and this just kind of went over my head, when you say different networks, does that mean I have three or four different routers? Does that mean I have Comcast and you know the ABC company? You know, what, how, what does that mean when you say different networks? I would identify it as different platforms of the network. So yes, kind of like a, a different router for each one. Um, you don't have to use different vendors, so you, if you want to use Comcast, you can use Comcast for each one. That's not a big deal. It's more of having that single IP address to be towards different networks. And so it's not all on one and leaving all of your systems vulnerable for everything. Got it. So it's, it's about the different IP addresses so that things are running independently, but yet they're still together. Correct, yes. Fabulous. Okay, so is there anything else then on that technology side? I think one of the things um, you also had told me is how do you f identify and evaluate um, either an outside agency, right, like yourselves, you know, that help identify these risks, monitor these risks, and then implement some of the uh, recommended um, applications to to make all these things work. How do how do you go about doing that? What do what do you where do you start even other than the risk assessment that we talked about? Like, hey, where am I vulnerable? But how do you choose? You know, when to bring somebody in to help you with this? Sure. So on the physical side, you do have monthly monitoring of your alarm system uh, for surveillance and access control. It can be self monitored, or you can have. A third party company that monitors it for you it can be a lot especially at larger facilities like cultivation retail i would say that um, there's typically a security director or a security manager or they do just ask for the integrator to uh, monitor it for them but for cybersecurity, it's recommended to have somebody manage it constantly um, obviously when something is on the internet it can evolve pretty quickly. And so having things in place like ransomware, malware, things to prevent phishing, um, having a proper firewall, but really implementing something that has that constant management. It is something that it's, it's not gonna happen when everyone's just sitting there on the computer and watching for it. It's you clicking on a link. It's downloading something you're not supposed to download. And a lot of times these emails they are really looking very real and it can be off by one single letter. They might replace a one with an L. And so responding to that email might be the only thing that's between you and being hacked. And so having that constant management to where they can go and almost quarantine the computer that has been infected or the point of sale system that has been infected, it can shut it down from infecting the rest of the systems that are on that network. So is that an outside service that's like a monthly uh subscription basically yes it is and you know I know that um, you have your initial funding and payments towards the IT company that puts certain items in place to where it does prevent it but again it is something that's ever evolving so monthly payments just to have that managed and it's a 24 7 service to where you can really be proactive about having that security in place and be able to react to it as they should so one of the other threats that we talk about um, is, you know, obviously um, damage to your inventory, right? So 
this is going to lead into our theft conversation, but before we get there, right? So when we talk about the supply chain, right? So people that have access to any parts of um, whatever you're producing, the finished goods, access and tampering, but even sometimes we don't even go beyond product, but we also look at brand, right? And your reputation. And some of, you know, in this 24 seven, IG, TikTok world, right? It can also be, you know, negative or misinformation about you as well. What happens? How does all of that get looked at? You know, um, absolutely. Social media is a huge platform of getting your brand name known. Um, Obviously, we have the kind of business side of LinkedIn and Instagram, but then we also have Facebook, Twitter, and like you said, TikTok. It, it's something that that's just how you reach an audience. Um, there are a lot of vulnerabilities, and if you think about it like this, if you look on Facebook, Snapchat, it has a memory. So whenever it's on this day, um, you know, it's it can say where the location was that you were at, it can identify the difference between a dog and a human, and that's something that can be vulnerable. These platforms have kind of had a history of being hacked, and if there's anything that might have been in that image that would maybe leave you vulnerable, like a behind the counter, or it's your employees having a a break time, and there just happens to be that one small little item that's in the back corner of that, that could be a risk for you. And obviously, it's what else is on that network that you were submitting that picture on. So really having the awareness of what you are posting. There are certain regulations about what you are allowed to post and what type of verbiage you're given permission to use. Um, And it just goes into a deeper dive, a, a dive of what to expect whenever you do want to post on social media. It's recommended, honestly, that You should be using somebody that's professional and understands the regulations. Each state's different. Some are more requiring than others, but really being aware of what you are allowed to post and what you aren't allowed to post and what's professional for your business because obviously protecting your brand is extremely important. Um, I think that in this industry, if you get a bad rap for something that you might have posted that wasn't appropriate, it's very well spread. So keeping that in the back of your head whenever you post something is important. Let's let's as we go into to theft, let's let's talk about the internal theft first before we go to external theft, right? And and so yeah, we all like to believe that when we hire people and we bring them on board that we've done some vetting, we've checked references. To your point, sometimes it includes a background check. But we're dealing in an industry because we don't have really um, access to real banking yet. We don't have access to a lot of things that are the norms in any other industry, right? Because we're still fighting um, the stigma of being drugs versus medicine versus, you know, not even treated like alcohol, right? We're so, you know, we've got so many moving parts here that need to be addressed. But when we look at the the whole staffing, right? And, and even though we have different aspects of when we bring somebody on board with, you know, the company handbook, which is your rules and regulations, we have non-disclosure agreements, but we have a lot of things that people have access to, including cash, including product, including the flower, including the genetics of the flower, the seeds, right, and the cultivation side is equally as valuable. Um, And so what what are some of the, one, what are the things to, to put in place to mitigate that as much as possible? But secondarily, what are some of the more innovative ways to encourage people not to do these things that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll tell you the first things first is having an employee theft policy in place is crucial. Knowing how to handle it. A lot of times, obviously, when management comes across an an internal theft event, it can be a little bit uncomfortable to handle, and especially if it might have been their first time in management. Um, But it's important to really, one, know how to report it, know who to report it to, and be able to really identify what exactly happened. So having that training of the employee theft policy um, can really help prevent it from happening. On another 
side, I would say that there are companies that we've worked with that do have a discount for employees. They're absolutely okay with employees using the cannabis that they sell at their dispensary, for example. Um, but it's more so that they can have a better understanding of the product. It's kind of the same thing as working at a wine bar and being able to take one of the bottles of wine home for a small price, and it gives you that discount. Um, but you know, it is something where if you can provide that discounted cannabis product, it, it could reduce those chances of somebody potentially steal, stealing from the location. Because we're so new to this industry and there's so many things, again, happening so quickly, and you, know, you might not have somebody that's very experienced in management and leadership, uh, as hard as that challenge might be, sometimes, to your point, you might have to make it a little bigger, like you might have to use authority to, to let people know you're serious about this, right? And again, I wanna just kinda go back into that whole thought process around SOPs, right? These standard operating procedures and how crucial it really is to think about the roles and responsibilities of every job. Like, it's not just, I'm gonna put out a job description and I'm gonna hire you and have you do this. If I don't put any investment and time to train you to actually do these functions, then there's a loss. Absolutely. Right? And not only the loss of the potential of having an employee that can be with you over time and grow, there's the loss of all the other things that can happen, correct? Correct. Training is number one. Um, how, do you, how do you know how to respond to something if you've never been explained that? Um, that process, we do a lot of robbery and burglary awareness training, but beyond that, it's how do you respond to seeing a coworker knowingly steal? How do you respond to that? And you know, having a safe place to where you can go and report that and feel like you can trust your management to be able to, to do so is extremely important. And something that we have offered some of our clients is a theft hotline so they can anonym, anonymously report it. And they don't really have to feel insecure about what they're reporting. They might be friends with the person that they work with, but it's, it's important to report any time that you do see any type of theft, whether it's damage to the plants, damage to the packaging, um, all of these items could put you out of business. And so it's important for your employees to feel safe about reporting those incidents and then responding in the correct manner. And the correct manner obviously is if you do see an employee who is stealing or who is knowingly doing damage to any of the products, cash, anything like that is, to take action and the proper action obviously is to let that person move on because if one person sees it and then if they imagine that the management thinks it's okay then that might make them think it's okay and then there's a chain reaction of damage or loss and so either way you want to make sure that you're proactive about that and that you do respond the way that you're supposed to respond so you just said one of the services you provide is training on how to deal with robberies and thefts. Can you talk about that? What does that mean? Absolutely. Um, I would say the number one thing is nobody's life is worth the cash or the cannabis products. Um, always cooperate. There are um, items in place at most dispensaries and cultivation facilities like hold up or panic buttons that would discreetly dispatch the police department if you go to um, open your location in the morning and somebody comes up, they're holding you at gunpoint, you can put what's uh, called a duress code into the alarm keypad. And what it'll do is it will appear that you are um, disarming the system, but it does send a signal to the police department that you are in an emergency situation. Um, so knowing how to respond to those can kind of help with that awareness. Um, some more awareness is, again, just really cooperating, doing everything they say, try to just get them in, get them out, don't let them be there for any longer than they have to, give them the cash, but a proactive thing that we like to tell our customers is how much cash are you keeping in your cash register? You should keep the amount of cash as low as possible. So what we recommend is having cash drop boxes below each register that are locked. And so for them to have to go through that process, the burglar or robber, they're probably going to try and get in and out as quickly as possible. If you're closed and you're concerned about having your store burglarized is 
we say keep your cash drawers open and keep them empty. Let people know that there is nothing in them. There is nothing to steal. And again, having product out on your retail floor overnight when nobody is there, it's probably not the best idea. So putting that in your secured storage where there's multiple barriers uh, for a burglar to get to before they can gain access to any cash or cannabis. Just keeping it as far away as possible. If they look through a window and they can see it, why wouldn't they go grab it? So again, keeping it out of the line of sight is one way of preventing it. But again, it's all about going back to training and having a good understanding of what to do in those kinds of situations. So when we talk about these other concerns, um, obviously one of the things we've seen over these last um, two years particularly, you know, one, COVID, you're wearing a mask. <laughs> we see a lot of hoodies. Like, so we're, you know, we can't get the facial descriptions necessarily. Our cameras aren't going to get that. I've heard often look at shoes. Shoes sometimes can be... <laughs> an indicator. But one of the things that we've seen in these really aggressive um, burglaries and is sometimes, you know, we're not getting the cooperation. We're not taken seriously. Again, not fully being treated like any other industry yet. That we're not getting the response. And sometimes even the people that are taking and seizing our properties and our money are supposed to be the authorities that we trust, right? And so how do we try to change that relationship what how do we build on you know better um community you know uh something that we do with a lot of our clients who are just in the application stage is we ask them if they want us to talk to the local police chief i think having that upfront communication and um kind of the open line of trust is really what can initiate that that relationship to where when something does happen they are more than willing to respond um, I do see a lot that the police response time has gone down quite a bit. Um, so it's, it's something where we want to maybe even make friends with our neighbors, being involved with any local events that could be going on and obviously not going to promote cannabis or anything, but more so of just going and developing those relationships. Know who your neighbors are, let them know that, hey, you know, if we ever see anything, we're more than happy to say something and let you know that something's going on but hopefully they'll want to do the same thing for you because it's not just a, it's not just a dispensary, it's, it is a business and it is a legitimate business and you had to go through a very grueling process to get to that point. So having that trust, having that communication and really just trying to develop those relationships with your community can be kind of a proactive way of when something does happen that you do have those people around you that might be able to help you through a theft or um, a burglary or anything to where if there's an event that occurs, they would be willing to work with you on that. And, you know, the other thing is a lot of what we just discussed really has to do with an actual building of some form, right? And we, and we touched on technology and cyber and, um, and IP, but the other is vehicles, right? We, we're moving product around. What, is, what are our concerns here? Um, there's a lot of concerns when you are a moving vehicle and I would say you're not exactly bulletproof. Um, the number one thing I would say is having your security system for your vehicle in place. So that would include some surveillance that would include having, um, your GPS activated at all times, never having just one employee, but a second employee, because obviously there's the front and the back of the vehicle. The back is going to be your secured area. Um, and speaking of the secured area, having good locking mechanisms in that back area, keeping your cash and cannabis separate. That would mean more time to be able to access both, but that's the same for the employee as well as a burglar or robber. So keeping those separate, um, having an unmarked vehicle, you don't want it to say, you know, hey, we're, we're carrying cannabis and cash, come and get it, you know, so keeping it unmarked, changing up routes frequently, um, and kind of going back to the perimeter fencing at a cultivation facility is the less people can see, the less urge they'll have to burglarize or rob a transportation vehicle. So keeping that under locked closed doors and hidden away would help kind of prevent that. But again, changing the routes so that you're not easily followed. Um, and I would say, again, training. Training is huge. 
and um, limiting the amount of cash and product that you have in the vehicle. When obviously, the more that you have, the more vulnerable you are, but making any stops that you can to where you can put the cash away at the bank or to the next vendor or retailer that you're trying to go to, um, but really keeping the amounts that are in the vehicle as low as possible throughout the whole transport of that day. Are there environmental things that we need to also be aware of when we talk about security? Obviously, you know, we have climate issues, other, you know, what are some of those things that also fall under security? Well, I'll tell you, I live in Dallas, Texas, and um, obviously last year we had quite the shutdown. We had no power for days, and um, I'll say most states, their requirements on security backup is about 15 minutes, um, maybe a couple of hours but we were out for days. And just thinking about recent storms that were in the Northeast is uh, you've, you've got to take that in consideration. So uh, for cultivation facilities, we always recommend a generator every single time. You want to make sure that you have more than sufficient backup power because it's not just your security, but it's also your product. Your product can be completely damaged and ruined. So keeping that up and running as long as you can is important. And then I would say for dispensaries, it's not as common to have a generator there, but if you know that there is an event where there might be severe weather and it's coming, is that's when you can contact your um, the regulator that did your inspection or just somebody from the state that there is bad weather coming and what can we do with our product to get it out of the store because we don't know when power is going to be back up. Same thing, you know, if a hurricane occurs, you never know if you'll ever even be able to go back to that location. So, putting it somewhere secure just so it's not out to who knows where so anything that you can do to be proactive before the storm occurs or before an emergency event to where you're having to shut it down for more than a couple of days just get the product out of there and take it somewhere safe so just to recap a little bit we've talked about when we're thinking about risk and security we are really looking at so many different parts of this visibility lighting, environmental, employee, community, um, technology, cyber, cash, product, IP. It's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, right? And it is everyday occurrence. So what do you think um, is the most, you know, if, if you're up and running and you're not really dialed into all all of this right now, what do you think are the number one things that we should know um, today, the challenges in cannabis? And particularly, you know, as we're in states that don't have full adult use, have some form of medical, may only have some CBD, but in not a really well defined like, what, are, what do we need to be thinking about today? Um, I would say that the number one thing is just being proactive about everything that you would be doing security-wise, whether that be with your physical security, your training, with your standard operating procedures, um, really just everything that could be involved in your day-to-day -day operations. And again, I, I'll keep going back to training, but knowing what to expect worst case scenario and being able to secure everything. I mean, you spend, again, a lot of time and money on building your business, and uh, it's a high-risk business, and people are getting smarter. People are getting more desperate to get what they need to to survive, and so being proactive about putting certain standards in place to reduce that is probably going to be your best solution at this time. It's, you know, it's, again, we don't know what the police response time will be. We don't know if there may or may not be a burglary or a robbery that's going to occur. So just putting best practices up first is, is gonna be your best way to prevent it from happening. Again, explain to me then the, the difference between proactive and reactive. Sure, so proactive security is where you are implementing certain security practices before anything happens. Reactive might be something where you're going to review surveillance footage of something that already occurred. So if you keep your facility locked down at all times, that's proactive. You're not letting them gain entry into your facility. But reactive is where you go and look at the video and you see them going and stealing your product. 
So it can help with insurance, but if you, let's just say, for example, you're using a gun safe for your cannabis or your cash. Gun safes are meant for guns. They're not meant for cash. They're not meant for cannabis. They're super easy to break into compared to what we like to call a TL30. Um, that is a rated safe for tools, and so it would have less of a chance of being broken into. And um, so we say, if you have a good safe, then how will they be able to get into your product? So if you're storing it where you're supposed to, that's being proactive. You've got a good safe that has done amazing through the riots, um, as opposed to a gun safe, which was extremely easy. And Denver recently posted a new regulation that there are no more gun safes allowed. You have to have a TL30 because that's what works. So you're being proactive by having the right safe for what you are securing, which again is everyone wants to be a part of that. So, you know, they, they want to go get any cash, any cannabis they can, but if you keep that under lock and key, then you shouldn't have any worry about theft on that. This has been just a, a fascinating conversation, right? And we've covered a lot of ground and, and we're, you know, coming up on these last few minutes. What do you, you know, is there anything else that you think that we missed or also anything that you think is really um, the one takeaway, two takeaways for today that, that you really want to, to just bring this conversation home? Sure, I'll say that um, within the industry, what we're seeing the most is your biggest threat is internal. So reviewing your standard operating procedures consistently, just knowing where you stand, maybe changing them a little bit. Each business is different. You can have 10 dispensaries and one dispensary to another dispensary might be completely different. Uh, so going reviewing those and absolutely calling you know, a, a third party in for help on that can always help. Um, you know, I think uh, internal theft, there's certain things that we implement that maybe others don't, which is, for example, don't use black trash bags whenever you're disposing of cannabis or trash. And um, what we've seen in the past is somebody who was using gloves, they would stick a little bit of cannabis in the glove and they would pull them off and throw them into a black trash bag and then take it out to the dumpster. And even though this person was not the one going back to the dumpster later on, there was somebody else that was going to get it knowing that there was going to be cannabis in that trash bag. So using clear trash bags, um, again, leaving the drawers open whenever you're closed and no, no cash in sight whatsoever, but implementing those best practices um, and being proactive again with the training, knowing how to use your systems, knowing that everything is operating correctly, going and review, reviewing who has access to your alarms, your access control, your surveillance systems, uh, taking away keys if you can for the building if there was a manager who has moved on, um, but really reviewing them constantly. You know, it's, um, it's something that's ever-changing, and we have had more than enough, I think, surprises over the past few years. But keeping in mind that there is something new that can happen any day and being aware of it and just trying to implement everything you can to prevent something from happening. This has been fascinating, and I completely forgot about the, the trash bags because, yeah, we don't even think about something so simple as being so possibly detrimental. And all of these things add up. And then when we you know, think about budgeting, we always forget that training needs to be like utilities. You have to pay for it. You have to invest in it. You have to upgrade it. You have to continually monitor it. And our other security systems are the same way, right? And how we protect all of our assets becomes crucial, but also our people. Absolutely, and I'll, I like the word that you just used, invest. Um, I think that doing the training or um, hiring somebody to manage your, your networks and everything that's on it is an investment. It, it can be costly, but at the same time, once something happens, your insurance will call and they'll say, well, did you have a ransomware in place? Did you have any managed services whatsoever? And when you say no, they probably will not help you as much as they would if you did. So again, that's a proactive security practice that you can put in place. Fantastic. I, you know, I'm so excited that you're in our community and that um, definitely people can, can reach you through our, our Facebook group, but also how else can we get in touch? 
Um, so I, I guess I could go ahead and just shoot off my email. It's H for Haley and then Glover, G-L-O-V-E-R at sapphirerisk.com and that's S-A-P-P-H-I-R-E.com or sorry, sapphirerisk.com. But um, yeah, I mean, I can do that. And then um, I can also share my LinkedIn on the page once this is posted. So fantastic. We will look forward to that. I, um, again, am Meryl at tracetrust.com. But we also um, want to thank you for being our first guest on this initial Inside Ops conversation. We will be hosting these once a month, so look for hearing who the next important guest is going to be. Or if there are topics, please reach out through the community and let us know what you um, are most interested in learning about. And we are just really excited about this future. And as women employed in cannabis, there's so much for us ahead. And being able to think about building safe and reliable industry is, is, is the key to all of our success. So Haley, thank you for your time. You've been so generous and I look forward to further conversations. Me as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.